So what do you think needs to change about the way we solve problems? Well, one way to look at it is a shift from control to participation. And that depends on there being something to participate in that's bigger than ourselves. We can see that sometimes on a human level, like if you're working with a community, with a group of people, and there's something that you all care about, and it's bigger than yourself, and you begin to ask, how can I serve this thing? When you extend it beyond the human to the whole planet, then to believe that there is a purpose beyond, beyond ourselves, beyond just human beings, you're getting into unfamiliar metaphysical territory unfamiliar at least to the dominant culture of the planet, uh, modern culture, which says that there is no purpose or intelligence or consciousness outside of human beings, that the world is a bunch of stuff without the qualities of a self. So if you accept that, then order and progress and intelligence in the world can only come if we impose it upon the world. So naturally, from that basic assumption, naturally we become the dominator species. That's a very, uh, that, that, that assumption that we are the only intelligence and the only consciousness. That is pretty much unique to modernity. Uh, Surviving indigenous cultures don't think that. Uh, nobody thought that, actually, until recently. Um, and, and you could historically trace the, the origin and development of that way of seeing the world, you know, back probably to ancient Greece and so forth. And I think that that, so that's another part of the old story that I call it, the, the story of separation, that is really ready to transition, to transition into we're in a living universe, an intelligent universe full of beings. There are beings everywhere and they have the qualities of a self, not the same way that we do. A dog is not the same as a person. The consciousness of a dog is not the same of a person, let alone the consciousness of a, of a brick or, or a rock or the sun. But our assumption that these things are not, these, these are things, that they are things, not beings, that they do not have the qualities of a self, that, that prevents us from seeing things that we need to be seeing and making inquiries that we need to be making, such as what does, this, what does the land want? What does the soil want? Now, there are people in permaculture, regenerative agriculture, who are asking that. They're saying, hey, soil, you are a being. What do you want? knowing that not only is the soil a being and the water and everything else, but we are, our being is not separate from their being. There's an intimate relationship between all things and that therefore, if we take good care of the soil, if we participate in the health of something bigger that includes the soil, then we will benefit as well because we're not separate. More for you is more for me as well. If we have that attitude toward nature, then we're not going to treat nature as a pile of disposable resources and a gigantic waste dump. Because we'll be asking different questions. What does the forest want? What does the water want? What does the ocean want? Like even to think in those terms already changes everything. How would you propose this to somebody who is very materialistic, who has never had this experience, who just listens to this and says, what a bunch of hippie nonsense. I have never heard, you know, a rock or, or the dog talk to me. And if you have, maybe you're crazy, you know, like, and a lot of people do think this way. So how do you propose something like this? And, you know, what if they say, okay, well, you know, I, I'm a businessman. I can go and, and log this forest and make this many dollars from it. So why do I care about how the forest feels? Like basically the narrative of Avatar, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's a good example. Um, unless somebody is ready to, to step into that belief system, 
then you're not going to be able to persuade them to step into it. It's actually not a matter of persuasion because the story of separation is internally coherent and anything, any uh, proposal that violates it can be waved off as hippie nonsense. So the question is, and, and the story that I'm talking about, the story of interbeing is also internally coherent. So we have these two stories and this happens in life all the time. You know, you can have two stories about politics or two stories about another person. Um, there's, there's maybe, you know, a fighting couple, you know, and he has his story and she has her story and whoever you're listening to, that one seems right. It's like two different realities. So the question then, really what you're asking is how do, how do people change their beliefs? What, ha what has to happen for somebody to step into a different belief system? And the, for me, the key is to realize that these are not just intellectual constructs that rise and fall based on evidence and logic, but they are the emanation uh, or the narrative skin on top of an entire state of being. So if somebody has had a certain experience of life that leaves them alienated, traumatized, um, and cut off from the magic and synchronicity and connectedness that's possible in life, then they're gonna very naturally gravitate toward, yeah, let's log the forest and maximize profits. So I, I, I wanna ask, you know, what happened to cut that person off and how do we get back in touch, get them back in touch with their love and care for maybe for the forest or maybe for something, anything, anything to give somebody an experience of connectedness, then they're going to be, then, then the story of separation, the story of this forest represents 30,000 board feet of lumber, that will become less appealing. Sometimes it, you know, it could just be that they have, uh, um, maybe they have a marital crisis and then a big reconciliation and forgiveness, or maybe they're at the, the bedside of their, their father who they'd had a problematic relationship their whole life and there's forgiveness in that moment. And, and then like their whole worldview changes and they become more receptive to, to standing in their care and living to serve. And those old stories become um, unappealing to them. What's changed here? It's not that you finally overcame their mental resistance and gave them so much data, such strong proof of climate change that they could no longer resist and you defeated them. But that seems to be the, the vain hope of the climate movement, that we're going to defeat defeat the other side. We're going to overwhelm their disbelief with more and more evidence. And it is not working. So it seems like it just has to be something that organically happens because, you know, if we take this approach of trying to force people into a new story, then it's basically just the old approach. Well, yeah, but that doesn't mean to do nothing. Um, it means to really ask, how do I create conditions for beliefs to change? How do I create an experience of the world that is more connected? more loving, more, more intimate. 